bring this to order, the regular meeting of the Waverly City Council held here at the Council Chambers at 5 p.m. Tuesday, October 10th, 2017. The first uh, thing on the agenda is the approval of the minutes of the regular council meeting and the strategic planning priorities meeting held September 25th, 2017. Just before we do it, I would like to make note that Mr. Wheeler is out sick. We still have a quorum with six uh, members of council here. Approval of the minutes. Do we have a someone? I'll make that it? motion, Your Worship, that we accept the minutes as presented. Do we have a seconder? I'll second that, Your Worship. Discussion? All in favor? Minutes moved. Addition to the agenda, is there anything? Mr. Hardy? Thank you, Worship. Uh, I uh, wanted to uh, get some direction from Council. Um, there's, uh, uh, we have the ability to have some discussions with respect to the uh, Fieldhouse Multi Purpose Center in Council, and we have the ability to also speak in, uh, in strategic planning priorities. Uh, I just want to uh, know what the wish of Council is, because if we do want to put it in, we could put it under new business. I would like to uh, see, I myself would like to see the discussion of the field house held here under new business tonight. Mr. Van Betcher? Your Worship, I'd agree. I think that we could probably give the public a rundown of, of discussions that we are having. Um, I, I think we would, I would ask that we probably do go in our strat planning to dis discuss further the, uh, the direction that we but, but start off with but the new I business here tonight. I would agree. Yep. Yep. So put that under the agenda as item number 10C, Your Worship. 10C, field house. Yep. I'll move that addition, Your Worship. Do you have a seconder? I'll second that, Your Worship. All in favor? <laughs> Carried. <laughs> There are no public hearings and proper uh, uh, notices here tonight. So with that being said, we're moving forward to the original communication delegations and petitions. Tonight we have four. The first one is we have uh, the proclamation uh, about Communathon. Sabrina Kraft will be leading out uh, speaking up at the mic, please. And we have two young guests with us, our two superheroes from the Communathon. Thank you, Your Worship. As mentioned, I'm Sabrina Kraft. I'm the president of the Wayburn and District United Way, and I'm the chair of Communathon. I'm here tonight with uh, Taylor Cameron and Landon Field, who are our Communathon superheroes for the 36th annual Communathon. Um, we are asking City Council and Your Worship to proclaim um, October 15th to 21st as Communathon Week. Um, whereas the Weyburn and District United Way have, has been a strong supporter of community causes and local member agencies for over 50 years. Whereas the Weyburn United Way's Communathon, the single annual fundraiser has been supported by local businesses, organizations and schools and hundreds of local volunteers. And whereas the majority of funds that are raised by the Weyburn and District United Way is allocated to local member agencies who then invest those funds in their programs and services. Um, Communathon this year is uh, Friday, October 20th and Saturday, October 21st. We have 14 member agencies for, um, that have uh, applied for funding from the Weyburn and District United Way and our goal is $140,000. Um, during the Friday portion of Communathon, we'll be showcasing local entertainment on our Access 7 community channel throughout the day. That includes our school groups and young performers like uh, from all the way from Weyburn. And for the first time on the Saturday, we're doing the Communathon Concert Jam, where we're bringing in seven different Canadian bands. And the Concert Jam is buy ticket only to see those bands, $50 for the day, come and go, and you can see the, the, those bands. Um, and like I said, um, the United Way was this organized in 1955 as an umbrella organization for our member agencies. And in 1982, we um, started hosting our what we call our Communathon. And it has changed its looks and appearance in a number of years, but we're very happy for this year to be our 36th annual Communathon. 
With that, I urge all citizens to cooperate with this exciting event, and therefore, on the occasion of its 36th Communathon, I, Marcel Roy, Mayor of the City of Weyburn, do hereby proclaim October 15th to the 21st as United Way Communathon Week. And again, I urge all citizens to cooperate with this exciting event, come out and show our support. Pass that down to the next one uh, Proclamation of Fire Prevention Week. With that one, I will read the proclamation here. Whereas the City of Weyburn is committed to ensuring the safety and security of all those living in and visiting Weyburn. And whereas North American fire departments responding to 365,000 home fires in 2015, according to the National Fire Protection Agency, or NFPA, and whereas North American home fires resulted in 2,560 civilian deaths, in 2015, representing the majority, 78% of all North American fire deaths, and whereas new, newer homes are built with lightweight materials that burn faster than older home construction, and whereas many of today's <coughs> products and furnishings produce toxic gases and smoke when burned, make it impossible to see and breathe within moments, and whereas these conditions contribute to a much smaller window of time for people to escape, a home fire safely with people having as little as one or two minutes to escape from the time the smoke alarm sounds and whereas a home fire escape plan provides the skill set and know-how to quickly and safely escape a home fire situation and whereas a home fire escape plan includes two exits from every room in the home a path to the outside from each exit smoke alarms in all required locations, and a meeting place outside where everyone in the home will meet up upon exiting, and whereas home fire escape plans should be developed by all members of the household, and whereas practicing a home fire escape plan twice a year ensures that everyone in the household knows what to do in a real fire situation, whereas Weyburn's first responders are dedicated to reducing the occurrence of home fires and home fire injuries through prevention and protection education and whereas Weyburn residents are responsible to public education measures and are able to take personal steps to increase their safety from fire especially in the homes and whereas the 2017 fire Pre prevention week theme every second counts plan two ways out effectively serves to educate the public about the vital importance of developing a home fire escape plan with all members of the household practicing it twice a year. Therefore, I, Marcel Roy, Mayor of the City of Weyburn, do hereby proclaim October 8th to the 14th, 2017, as Fire Prevention Week throughout this community. I urge all the people of Weyburn to find, develop a home fire escape plan with all members of the household and practice it twice a year and to participate in many public safety activities and efforts of the Weyburn Fire Services during Fire Prevention Week of 2017. The next one, <coughs> we have Aidan Roy, who is the youth representative of the Saskatchewan Liberal Party, he wishes to speak to uh, City Council here tonight about uh, he is active involved within the City of Weyburn and wishes to bring forth some uh, views and comments about the uh, school zone speed limit <coughs> bylaw. If you would please, Aidan, come to the podium and you can uh, state your name and your position and then go from there. Thank you very much. Uh, before I begin, I would like to thank City Council for allowing me to speak today on behalf of our community. With that being said, my name is Aiden Roy, and I would like to put forward an amendment to Traffic Bylaw 36, the speed limit in school zones. 
Since the last amendment to this bylaw, I've heard a lot of feedback from our community on what should be done to improve it, and in doing so, I thought it would be right to stand on their behalf and propose this new amendment. So the goal of this amendment is to meet the requirements of our growing infrastructure in Weyburn, as well as to match the regulations of similar bylaws across Saskatchewan cities. As it currently stands, tra traffic bylaw 36 reads as, the speed limit in a school zone is set at 30 kilometers per hour. The amendment I would like to make would change this to being the speed limit in a school zone is set at 30 kilometers per hour between the times of 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. One of the benefits of this amendment is that it strengthens Weyburn's infrastructure. This would allow for delivery services, taxi services, and freight trucks to do their job more efficiently, as they will not have to slow down and waste precious time by going through a school zone early in the morning or late at night. This also benefits our citizens who drive outside of these prescribed times. In addition, this amendment maintains the safety of our community, and most importantly, our children. The majority of our children do not attend school between 8 a.m., and very few are at the school past the time of 10 p.m. Ultimately, this amendment covers the maximum time a student would be in a school zone. The final benefit of this amendment is that it will relieve the pressure off of the police to enforce this bylaw at all times of the day. Although I am not an expert on the hardships of our police services in Weyburn, I feel that this amendment could benefit them greatly. In terms of the cost of this amendment, I project that the cost will be minimal as it is, simply, as, it is as simple as bolting on a sign underneath our currently erected signs stating 8 a.m. to 10 p.m., as noted on the sheets provided. I would like to once again thank City Council for allowing me to speak today, and if there are any questions, comments, or concerns, I am very willing to answer them. Thank you. So, at this point in time, what we will do with, with these type of delegations is that we will take this in and uh, take it as noted, and we will uh, move uh, Mr. Hardy to make note that on the next Council meeting we will have a discussion about this bylaw that's coming up. If you would be so kind, Mr. Hardy. Yes, Your Worship. And we'll put that down for our next uh, next uh, city councils, and we'll do the discussion about that. Thank right. you very much. <coughs> Thank you, Your Worship. Or, <coughs> I would suggest I would suggest that we send that uh, police commission. Okay. Send the recommendation to the police commission, and then the recommendation can come back from there to council. I would to council for next or for uh, next council meeting. Your, uh, as, go ahead. Just you, your worship, uh, yeah, uh, uh, just a clarification, uh, Councillor, I bet you uh, uh, we want to get the, your, your intent is to get the comments of the police commission before council decides on what the bylaw changes should be. Yes, I yeah, I believe the recommendation should come from the police, should go through the police. Doesn't have to. And then. Under the uh, Cities Act, council has, council has the authority okay. to make the bylaws. All right, well, I suggest we, anyways, that we, do we get a comment from, we'll the, get comments. from the police for sure. Certainly. Yes. Thank you, Your Worship. And that's like with so many uh, uh, of our bylaws here that we, we as council will make the decisions, but we'll get references and comments from the other parts. Very good. Any other comments? At this point in time, <clears throat> We uh, now, there's one more proclamation, the Pregnancy and Infant Loss Awareness Day. Is there any representatives here for us? Please come forward. To the podium, if you would, please. And state your names. Go ahead. I'm Amanda Payne. And I'm Lisa Laustel. Okay. So with this one, yeah, and you represent who, ladies? You are the representatives for the? I'm the representative for the Walk to Remember. Okay. And I'm the representative for the proclamation for the Pregnancy and Loss Awareness. Okay. And I will read the declaration. I am Marcel Roy, Mayor of Weyburn, uh, Saskatchewan. Are you going to read the proclamation for the Pregnancy and Infant Loss Remembrance Day? Whereas the Mayor Weyburn recognizes the Weyburnites who suffer from pregnancy and infant loss need emotional support from family or friends, and whereas Weyburnites need to be informed and educated about pregnancy and infant loss in order to respond with compassion to effective families, and whereas health care providers and other professionals who came in contact with families who have suffered pregnancy or infant loss can better serve Weyburn families if they have 
special training and better knowledge of pregnancy and infant loss. Now, therefore, be it known that I, Marcel Roy, Mayor of Weyburn, do hereby declare October 15th as being Pregnancy and Infant Loss Remembrance Day. I ask all Wavernites to join me in support, education, and awareness for grieving parents who have lost infants during pregnancy or shortly after birth. I thank you, ladies. Thank you. Thank and we you. give you our full support from this council. <clears throat> reports. Uh, we've got some reports of council coming up next. Economic development report. We would like to uh, have uh, Twala Walkman come forward. She is from our economic development. We welcome you here tonight and please enlighten us. Oh, I'll enlighten you. Um, uh, good afternoon, Your Worship, members of Council and City Administration. My name is Twyla Wakaden. I'm the Executive Director of Weyburn Regional Economic Development, and I'm here today to present an update on this community's economic development efforts. First, uh, for those that aren't aware, um, I'm here to clarify what Weyburn, Recon Weyburn Re Regional Economic Development is and how we are connected to the City of Weyburn. Weyburn's Economic Development Office, located at 11 3rd Street, is the central point of contact for business investment. We are governed by a board of directors that is comprised of local business leaders as well as representatives from both the city and the arm of Weyburn. We seek to foster economic growth in the Weyburn region by working with investors, government and community partners. Weyburn Regional Economic Development represents and is funded by two municipalities, the city of Weyburn and arm of Weyburn number 67. We assist business that are looking to invest in the Weyburn area and offer assistance in site selection, marketing information, and research, as well as, as, well as other areas that are too numerous to mention. In addition, our agency also leads Tourism Weyburn. Tourism continues to hold great opportunity for our community to prosper and grow. So today I wish to briefly touch on activities and initiatives that, that we've been working on within the past three or four months, as well as give you some fast facts. Our office works very hard behind the scenes to bring business and investment to our community. Economic conditions, as well as trends towards e-commerce and gener uh, generational preferences must be recognized when we determine a growth strategy for our community. Our goal is to make Weyburn the top choice to live, invest, and visit. Evidence that we're already doing a great job can be seen in the Money Sense magazine's ranking as the fifth place to live in Canada and the best place to live in the prairies. Some tangible delivers the deliveries that we're working on. Currently, we're in the final stages of the development of a valuable guide to the Weyburn retail market. Um, that's going to stand up to those demanding requests that we get from potential investors. Key pieces of data from the Census 2016, the National Spending Survey, and City of Weyburn traffic counts are being taken into consideration as well as consumption patterns in our community. Having a robust document such as this will put our community in a very favorable position with potential investors if we have, we have already done all their homework for them in terms of choosing the best community to live in, and that's ours. This guide will be available next month, and we're excited to see the results of a year's worth of work. Another tool that we're working on to attract investment is an online resource called Townfolio. I encourage all of you to log on to either our website at Weyburn Regional Economic Development or the city's website to view the data we've compiled. This resource will provide a comprehensive economic profile of Weyburn, an area that's very easily interpreted. Data ranging from levels of taxation to housing stats for our community can be found on this site. This is a game changer for economic development. 
And as a, an interesting note, the entrepreneurs who developed this software product are Saskatoon based and are making a profound global mark within this online platform. That, so that's something that we have to be proud of from a Saskatchewan young entrepreneur point of view. Weyburn Regional Economic Development, as well as representatives from the City of Weyburn, also attended both Saskatchewan Oil and Gas Show, as well as the Global Petroleum Show in Calgary, and this occurred in June. These have proven to be effective means of making business and potential investment contacts. So now I wanted to move a little bit into Weyburn Tourism that I think that you'll find interesting. So I'm going to present to you just with some quick facts. Did you know that Weyburn Tourism has a very robust social media presence? Just in the last 30 days or in the last month, we have reached over 9,000 people on Facebook and in that span of time had a 300% increase in our video views. In the last seven days or in the last week, we have a 575% increase in post engagements and have engaged 3,340 pe more people than we did the previous week. So our strategic use of social media allows us to effectively promote our events and community at virtually no charge. Did you know that over um, between Oct or June and October, Weyburn Tourism promoted close to 40 local events in and around our community? So those people that make the comments that there's nothing to do in our community might find, might find that statistic very interesting. Did you know that on an annual basis, Weyburn Tourism produces a guide that looks like this, that promotes all of what our city has to offer to visitors, and we distribute over 5,700 copies of these guides as far away as Minot. For those visitors that are more mobile-based, we also have a mobile-friendly um, page on our website that also has this as well because we know a lot of our visitors are traveling and don't want to pick up paper so they log on to our website and uh, find out what we have to, to offer mobile. So speaking of our neighbors to the south, did you know that Weyburn Tourism has developed a sister city relationship with Tourism Williston? Our communities have many ways to learn from each other in terms of reliance on energy as an economic driver and where tourism, fit, tourism fits into that economic equation. We view collaboration as the key to strengthening our community, whether it's with existing organizations in Weyburn or with surrounding communities around Weyburn. And lastly, did you know that only two people in our office work to accomplish all of these things? Um, I wanted to take a moment to have a shameless plug for our Montreal Canadiens alumni game that's coming up on December 1st. Um, tickets are very affordable. This is a once in a lifetime chance to meet uh, and see some of our NHL greats in action. And um, it's going to be the biggest event, tourism event that um, we have in Weyburn in 2017. Uh, Your Worship, it's been my pleasure to deliver this update on behalf of Weyburn Regional Economic Development. And I would welcome any questions or comments. Any statements? I'd just like to say that we, uh, we as council here again, are fully in support of all that you do. We think that you're doing a wonderful job. Things are moving along. We've got, there's a lot of excitement with the Montreal Canadiens. We hear that, and we're looking forward to seeing the game. Also, too, is that we're also looking forward to all the things that are going to happen within the next new year to along 2018. And let's watch for your next report. Thank you. Paul. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Our next report to Council, we have uh, our water treatment plant delivered by Councillor Bailey. Do you know all those chemical names now? Thank you, Your Worship. If you looked at this report and read it, I have to thank Shavir for not putting a hardly any of those names. So the <laughs> cup of coffee, I took them over there here a week or two ago, worked. So uh, Very anyway. <laughs> Sorry? It was watered down. It was watered down, yes, that's correct, Councillor Mickle. <laughs> this is a report from uh, our, uh, from Shavir from the uh, water treatment plant for September 2017. In testing, all bacteriological samples were taken and showed negative results. The monthly report was submitted to the Environmental Protection Officer for their review and filed in accordance with the requirements of our operating permit. 
in maintenance, uh, general maintenance is ongoing as uh, it always does in, in that facility. There's always something to do. Work on design and layout for the chlorine toner is underway. In operations, the total raw water drawn from Nickel Lake for the month of September was 144.8 uh, million liters. That's a lot of water. The level of the water at Nickel Lake has dropped 13.7 centimeters in September. The current level from overflow is at 78.7 centimeters below uh, full. The alkalinity and hardness of the turbi uh, turbidity uh, parameters of raw water are increasing. The dosage of chemical adjusted to oxidize LJ and other contaminants. Uh, undirectional flushing has been started all over the city. It started on September 25th and will continue until the second week of October. And we've seen it in all our communities, the, the, uh, that event going on. Uh, First Avenue Park uh, pumping station is offline due to this directional f flushing at that time. So once again, I thank Shavir for the short report and not quite as complicated. Any discussion? Questions? Just one thing, Your Worship, yes. if anybody's driving by 16th Street, you'll see that amazing uh, amount of dirt that has been moved out there. I don't know if we have a report of any kind on the progress of that, if we, we haven't anything. it would be something to look into to give us an update in a couple of weeks to see how that is. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, they're a busy bunch of people over there doing whatever they're doing, so. And that's where the reservoir is spent. Yeah, that's where it is. And uh, you, uh, I see uh, the size of it, I'm going, wow. <laughs> well, with that reservoir, uh, reservoir, it'll now keep us clean water up to the uh, population of 22,000 people. So another 10,000 people could move into the city and we'd still be with well within our parameters. So it's a very worthwhile project. Plus, we were getting a secondary uh, ultraviolet uh, cleaning of the water, sanitizing of the water. So we will be very, have some of the best water in, in Saskatchewan here. Oh, with, we did have already. We did, but will be even one more up higher? <laughs> with this one, we've got, uh, that's the reports of council. With that, I will say, make motion that we are, or should just say that those have been received and filed. Move on to consent agenda. There's nothing there. Motions. The first motion here is uh, counts payable. Thank you, Worship. I'm prepared to make a motion that the purchases in the amount of four million one hundred thirteen thousand seven hundred eighty-seven dollars and seventy-eight cents from September twenty-second to October fifth, twenty seventeen, be passed for payment. I'll second that motion, Your Worship. Discussion. All in favor. <coughs> Those are passed. Introduction of uh, the bylaws. We have bylaw 2017-3363 amending zoning, R2 to NC. If you wouldn't, Mr. Hardy. Your you Worship, uh, this uh, uh, you mic on. Pause. Put your mic on. Sorry, Your Worship, I would like to excuse myself. Okay. There's a conflict of interest. Mr. Van Betu is going to excuse himself at this point. Your Worship, the uh, report from staff indicate that the uh, bylaw by amendment went before Council on September 11th and received first reading. Uh, the City has completed the advertising and notice process as required under the Planning and Development Act and as well as no neighbourhood notice to all the property owners. There have been no comments or concerns brought forward as a result of the ads or the neighbourhood notice. Staff are therefore recommending zoning bylaw amendment uh, to uh, co uh, to accommodate that the, the sorry that the bylaw amendment passed to accommodate the development of a real estate office be given second and third readings at the appropriate time of council. With that one, if you would please, uh, Mr. Hardy, just to uh, give our citizens a bit of uh, talking about uh, bringing up speed. This is to move. Uh, it's a residential into a commercial area for a, for a, a real estate office. 
That's correct, Your Worship. And it, uh, what it does is uh, is that uh, that is allowed uh, with the uh, uh, that is allowed under our official uh, community plan um, with the uh, with the approval of council. And so the, we have gone through that the process of, uh, of ma making public notification as we are required under the Planning and Development Act, and we're reporting back to council that there have been no uh, there have been no uh, additional. Uh, 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 comments uh, received from the public with respect to uh, either su either supporting or uh, not supporting this uh, this zoning bylaw amendment. To take and this place. will be into the 200 block of Third Street. Can That's I correct. Correct. With that, uh, Mr. Bailey also has removed himself uh, from the voting here, and it is. We still have a quorum, I Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Good. Good. With that, Your Worship, I'll move that bylaw 2017-3363, <clears throat> a bylaw to amend City of Weyburn Zoning Bylaw 2003-2099 for the purpose of rezoning 343 2nd Street Northeast, lots 1 through 3, including Block 75, Plan S 4840, from R2 Residential to NC Neighborhood Commercial to be a read for a second time. I'll second that, Your Worship. Discussion? All in favor? <clears throat> Go ahead. Your Worship, I'll move that bylaw 2017-3363, a bylaw to amend City of Weyburn Zoning Bylaw 2003-2099 for the purpose of rezoning 343 2nd Street Northeast, Lots one through three included, block 75, plan S4840, from R2 residential to NC neighborhood commercial to be read a third time and passed. I'll second that, Your Worship. Discussion? All in favor? Lost? Or is the, it was that final reading? So with that, with being a final reading, we'll uh, go get the... <clears throat> we'll have to look into getting a page, like a parliament <laughs> page, <laughs> so that we, we <laughs> just, just stay. I think, I think it'll pass too. <laughs> so. They won't have to wear that funny uniform. They just have to wear it. Yeah, you'll give you a <laughs> An elf with <is> uniform. <laughs> Sorry, Your Worship, I should excuse myself sooner or not. I missed That's okay. the bed bad. Yeah. With that, we, we've got uh, our bylaw 2017-3365 off-site development levy bylaw. Mr. Hardy. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, in our attempt to uh, move ourselves forward, uh, straight forward and, and keep moving forward uh, to progressing to the making the uh, uh, final changes uh, to this uh, draft bylaw, um, I have uh, put in front of Council um, two additional changes based on some of the discussions that came up from our last uh, council meeting. Those, um, those uh, changes are reflected in uh, uh, section 6B, numbers 2 and 3 of the bylaw, as well as uh, the details of which are included in number 9. So the, the bylaw that is the, the amended draft bylaw, which is in front of council night right now for sort of for final direction before we move this forward, um, has done two things. Uh, one is, is identified is that in terms of when we're we're making specific, looking at making any proposals uh, where proposals are proposals, sorry, what we're doing in section two is we're allowing that where proposals involving development or redevelopment, uh, that there is a uh, equivalent lot charge, which has been used calculating the average amounts of you, uh, basically a half acre, uh, a half acre, um, uh, application or, or a half acre lot. So there's a lot charge which has been included in the bylaw now, which is an alternative to basically taking the whole of a, of a, of a, 
of a large area where there is redevelopment occurring and uh, knocking those, uh, basically identifying that that cost would be $15,287 per lot equivalent. Now what a per lot equivalent does is that is when you take a look at the uh, when you take a look at the development that's being done there is an equivalency that is uh, used by engineers in terms of identifying if a unit is uh, you know uh, for example, compares a commercial operation to a residential operation in being so many times greater the usage than the average household. So what this allows to do is it takes it takes an ability to instead of using the the cubic meter of the uh, the cubic meter of the development, it takes a look at the lot size and is able you're able to assess uh, a charge based on that. And I believe that was a, that was discussed with the uh, uh, with the acting city engineer some uh, time ago, and he's uh, recalculated those, and we've put those into the bylaw. So the section three under the uh, section six around the levy is identifies that where there is a development or a redevelopment which is anticipated to have minimal or no impact on existing or f anticipated future services where that where it is determined that they should be exempt from offsite levies or fees one it makes it makes it clear that the burden of proof in other words the demonstrated proof is to be provided by the developer that this that this will not occur and that can be done by matter of argument uh, verbal argument or written argument as to why there why there should there why there would be no additional uh, proof where there would be no additional burden put on the city's develop, development, but that it also allows the city to off-site in, in the event that uh, that exemption were granted, but it was found that there was an impact within the first three years of development, that the city would be in a position to uh, basically collect those fees retroactively. And so that basically, uh, in terms of process, that means that if it was determined to be exempt, and it had no impact, you know, that would be fine. The, the, the exemption occurs and there'd be no fees. But if there was found to be, a, the, but if there was found to be an impact adverse on any of the infrastructure, then the city would have the ability to collect those fees retroactively from the developer. And it would be, the agreement would be entered on title and transferred to any subsequent owner of the property. So it allows, uh, it allows for the, uh, where the minimal or no impact occurs, that it can, their exemption can occur. And as long as, as long as there is no impact, that continues right through. Finally, Your Worship, uh, in terms of uh, in terms of this, uh, I note that uh, in in this area that again, where there is any type of adjustment, that the adjustment has to be approved by council, and uh, they have the final say in terms of what those what those levies would be if there's any type of adjustment to be made. Discussion, councillors. I bet you. Yes. It is. Uh, Thank you, Mr. McCarty. Um, can you repeat all that? <laughs> Actually, the part that I didn't quite grasp, I'm sorry, was the lot equivalent off-site. Yes. Um, if there were, let's say, for example, if there were a, if a, if a, a residential lot is given a value of one, if there, and they, uh, and for the purposes of water and um, uh, wastewater, uh, the American Wastewater Association has identified a ratio that you would use that in effect, a restaurant would use 2.5 times that amount. And therefore you would take that lot charge and multiply it by 2.5 to get the proper charge for the, uh, for the, for the lot. So this is just, this was one way of, uh, of addressing the question that uh, Councillor, or the, the, the point that Councillor Bailey brought up about being a little more certain as to what that adjustment could be and how it could be derived. So there is a way, particularly in the area of water and wastewater, in being able to assess what the standard usage 
percentage would be in the absence of any you know major study being done being done by the uh, done by the developer. So that lot equivalent charge would be so for a house that amount would be fifteen thousand. Uh, for a restaurant or for a, a larger user, it would be based on what that what that category of use is against that. That's, that's again another particular standard that we would use in assessing what that fee might be. Okay. So, so would I be correct in saying that that's roughly a fifth of a acre? Sorry. Yes, you're correct. That is about a fifth of an acre. Okay. All right. Sorry, not the, not the half. It's a fifth of an acre. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Chessel, no questions? Mr. Richards. Well, believe it or not, I've got a few. <laughs> really. Thank you, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I would like to thank uh, the city manager for this new look at this very complex issue. I have to make sure, though, that I fully understand uh, there's a bit of change in direction here uh, from what we were looking at previous. So I want to be sure what we see in this new in this new um, proposal you have before us is a, is a slight change to the uh, the net hectare uh, costing, right? Correct. But the bigger change here is what we've oftentimes referred to as this infill piece. Correct? You're, you're suggesting that rather than looking at a square footage, we would look at uh, the cost to service a lot or the cost to increase services to a lot, right? I think that's a pretty cool idea. And, you know, I wouldn't be prepared tonight um, to, to make a decision on this until I was able to see how some scenarios would flush out. I like the idea. There's just a couple of questions I've got though. Number one, and I think you may have answered it, but I just want to be clear. Uh, in, in section six, um, six B three, bear with me as I get through this. Uh, the development or servicing agreement would allow the city to assess an off-site levy or fees retroactive for a period of up to three years after issuance, issuing an occupancy certificate. So that I understand, so let's pretend that, that we've, we've said there, there won't be a development levy on your project, uh, Mr. Developer, we think this is great, but, but a couple of years down the road, uh, we say, do you know what, it would seem like this has actually been quite an impact on our infrastructure. So we're going to assess you, in fact, that development levy. So that development levy could be as high as $15,287. In fact, it could be exponentially more than that. Depending on, certainly, the, yeah. the, the $15,000 the $15, would be basically the equivalent of a residential lot. So depending on what the impact was, it would be, Your it would be a factor of that. Sorry, yeah. there was so a bit of a factor of that. Yeah, so I, I get that. Uh, so who makes that assessment? It's, and and, and I, I'm trying not to oversimplify, but for my own purposes, I need to I need to know who at what point says that development's exceeding what we expected. We're going to assess a development levy. What does that process look like? Uh, through you, Your Worship, the process would be something that uh, staff uh, would be handled by staff or, or, for example, an engineering consultant, and they would raise the issue, and they would basically do an assessment based on some of the, f the factors like the AWWA handbook that says all of a sudden, well, there is this impact, there is this impact due to traffic or mm -hmm. to the water where you said it wasn't going to be. Now we're looking at, you know, there's there, there is a large impact and that recommendation would be one that would be taken to council at the end of the day because it's an alt it is a, it is a change to that and that so that would again excuse me that would again require the review it would be a staff recommendation that would be reviewed and confirmed by council okay Awesome. Thank you for that. That's exactly the answer I, I was hoping to get from you. Uh, that being said, though, it would be instigated by staff and it would be up to council of the day that once the recommendations would be just like everything else that the staff would say, we recommend this service charge be applied. And it might not be, uh, if I can kind of jump back and forth to page five, you've got it listed out as, you know, water treatment, transmission, et cetera. Yes. Uh, then you've got treatment and disposal, storm drainage, transportation, parks and recreation. So it may be, it may be any number of those or it may only be one or it may be the entire suite. That is correct. Okay, I think that we're on to something here. So what I don't like 
if I could just put two negatives on that, that I think we have to discuss more is a three year rear view mirror check. Okay, I think a developer might look at this and say, well, I've got the potential to get a $150,000 invoice three years after my project is complete. Not just me, but now I've sold my project and the way this is worded, that becomes the liability of the purchaser. And I do believe that will have an impact. I do believe that will be viewed by the development community and, and, and to the rest of the council, I would hope if you think I'm wrong, you would jump in on this, but I think they would see that as something they don't want to do. And I think in terms of trying to sell a commercial property, particularly, uh, I as a buyer would look at that and go, oh boy, I'm gonna need somebody to sign off on that before I ever write a check. And I'll back up Mr. Hardy on this, if you would, if I jump in on this. Sure. That I would think that that, I can kind of see where you're coming from. You can correct me on this one. But it's, we just simply don't want people to be sandbagging us. And they wouldn't have to worry about this, mm -hmm. whether if they're doing it, if they're all legitimately coming to us and saying, this is what we're going to be doing here, and this is what, what it's going to be, this is how the usage is. If they are truthful and honest with us, they don't have to worry about it. It is just those that if someone is trying sandbagging, going, oh, no, 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 we don't have that much usage. And the next thing you know, they've put a huge yeah. restaurants and all this other stuff in, and you're going, where did this come from? Your Worship, with all due respect, that w it still has an impact when the developer goes for financing, because that's registered to that project property so somebody is going to be struggling at their bank because a bank's going to say well wait a minute you want x dollars as a, as a mortgage for this commercial property but have you thought about this because it's registered right on the title as transferable on the title mm -hmm. and i think we can get ourselves uh, but i'll let you I'll let, we can debate that one the only other one i i struggled a little bit with uh is 10c the rate stated in this agreement shall be increased by two two percent each subsequent calendar year until the rates are reviewed and amended by council it is my understanding we review these every three years that's correct your worship so I don't see it personally see a need to raise the rate two percent every year. Okay, yeah, that that was done at the recommendation of the SETI engineer and is a regular practice as it relates to the fact that there's an inflationary factor and it just in it just in effect include includes the, the inflationary factor as to what the cost of construction does go up on on an annual basis. So that that was that's the basis on which that is put in there and, and council can decide a, as to how it wants to deal. Mr. Bickle. Thank you, Worship. I guess the question I have is an open question to all of council and mayor. Is is the intent of this offsite development levy bylaw, is it really what we want? I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with it. I think we're standing in the way of, of progress. Uh, we had 1222 square foot before, and that was in the way of progress, we were told. So we're changing it. I don't think we've really changed it that much. Uh, either we're in or we're not. I mean, our, if we're standing in the way of, of the local business person trying to expand his business, and there's still ob obstacles that he has to cross through with City Hall, what, what, what have we accomplished? Mr. Chesson? I guess I feel the same way, and much to touch on with uh, Councillor Richards. Uh, I, I'm... I guess I'm not sold on the 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 three-year process. Uh, I understand why. I get it. I understand where you two are coming from. But from a business perspective, as you worded, I would feel like I'm going to get sandbagged from the city of Weyburn because if all of a sudden there's more traffic in my business, then I may have to pay a fee. And I just I I I can't agree with that. Um, you know, as your business grows, if uh, if you get busy and use more water, potentially you might have to pay a development fee within three years. That puts some definitely some uncertainty into me. Mr. Bailey. Yeah, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, when I read this through, uh, Manager Roy, I I just I struggled with uh, part three here, uh, with the three year, with the two percent, uh, the two percent I didn't like at all. I would hope. If a developer came in and said, this is what we're going to do, we're building a house or we're building a business, that we could research it good enough. All I see is a fight here on hand, on, on hand with the way this uh, proposal is worded and looking to go ahead. I don't, I think we're discouraging 
you come and build, but you know what? We might be able to do this to you. And I, I think we've, we want to go beyond that as, as this council. I want to go beyond that as this council anyway. So I had struggles with that. I agree with uh, Councillor uh, Richards that, that uh, I understand a little bit for the cost person, but we're here to grow and to put little things attached to growth. You're not growing. Mr. Van Betjew. I don't have a lot of comment, but I think the purpose of that uh, um, paragraph is in case the proponent developer came and misrepresented to the city what the intended service was going to be. I, I would think if you built a restaurant and it was horribly busy or whatever, that wouldn't affect your, your rate. But I think it's more to protect the city for in case it was misrepresented about how much service was going to be used, what water was going to be usage, and et cetera, et cetera. So maybe we could reword that paragraph so we are protected, but maybe in a, in a different method. But I think that's the intent of the of that. Uh, Mr. Your Worship, that, that is the intent, to protect, protect the city in the event of a misrepresentation. Not, not, not to nickel and dot, not to, not to so-called nickel and dime, but to protect the city in the event of a total misrepresentation. We can make that clear, yeah. Mr. Richards. Thanks, Your Worship. I appreciate that, Manager Hardy. I think you're on the right track. Frankly, I, I find it. I'm surprised that I'm the I'm the easy sell on the on the lot charge. I think I'm going to write this down. We'll talk about it at home tonight. But uh, I don't mind the way that you've structured this. To be quite honest, I I think it's a nice way to look at exactly what the intent of the thing is to make sure that that the people of Weyburn are protected. Because you're absolutely right. Infrastructure costs. We're seeing it tens of millions of dollars this stuff isn't cheap anymore but but i i don't like the, the three-year rearview mirror check i think that will be a disincentive i think uh, from a finance standpoint i think that banks will look at that if somebody comes to buy a property with that sort of a, a fish hook in its rear end and they'll go i'm not so sure we want to be a part of that i think that there's work i think it's very much on the right track but i just think there's some some fine tuning that needs to be done in in 6b3 what would you suggest? I don't know. That's why I don't get paid what he does. I only come with I only come with right three, ideas. Three, three, are you saying three years or two years? Uh, no years, no. quite frankly. I, I think I think if I if I if I understand the, the discussions and, and between Councillor Van Betu and, and Councillor Richards and, and the councillors beside me here, is that the the concept that they're talking about is in protecting the municipality's interest is fine. It's 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 basically how to word it in the bylaw to do that. And uh, in that case um, I will just uh, I, I will uh, do a little bit of conversing with the with the city solicitor just to make sure that that I've got that but 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 I appreciate I appreciate that comment mr. Chels yeah and, that, and that's great Roy. I think I, I'm on that same path I, I definitely am out for the city but I just don't want anyone in the business community feeling yeah. like you said there's a fish hook could come three years down yeah. the road and and reading that when I read it last week, that's the first thing that came to my mind. So, can I just put one more comment? Sure. And if you, and it's, it's, thank you, Your Worship. Since you sort of asked for my input, now we're going to be here all night because no, I've got all. There's a only there's a bell. Oh, is, it, is there a bell? Yeah. I think I think Roy, uh, Mr. Hardy, part of what's happened here too is there's a lot of um, burden of proof on the developer. I would love to see that language the other way around, right? That burden of proof. For example, you know, if I, I do believe we're right. We want to protect against misrepresentation, right? So I think we have to be sure that that's what's happened here, that we're able, a developer should be coming in here very confident that there is no chance he is going to pay that levy. There's no chance because he's been upfront. He has said, here's the plan I've got and don't worry about me, don't worry. I don't want him to feel like he's got to go through so much work to prove to us that he goes, you know what? I'm just, I'm probably just not going to do this. That's what I don't want. So there's a lot of language in there that I that I get is very city solicitor speak. But as a developer, as a as an investor, I might read that and go, boy, that's not very friendly. Sorry, Mr. Van Bister. I agree, Council. Keep it simple. And uh, I, I would 
I th as far as the two percent goes, I can't hardly believe I'm saying this, but <laughs> I, I would say I would leave it out because I can see ourselves every year going back, people coming back, say, well, I didn't quite make up my mind and I was wondering if I can get that 2% discount anyways. And I can see that going on and on and on. So I, I would leave it out for the three year period and just leave the rate where it is and then we'll review it in so three years. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, Mr. Richards. If that's the worst problem we have to deal with in the next three years is that the developments are coming so fast and furious that we've got to put it up 2%, I'll more than happily make that motion. <laughs> And it will develop like that. Confidence. Right. Yes. So with those comments, uh, Mr. Hardy, do you have direction from Council? Yes, I do, Your Worship. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Council, that we've given Mr. Hardy the direction. With that, we'll move on to uh, old business. We have tree removal request. Mr. Hardy. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, the uh, information from uh, staff uh, was provided, uh, you know, in terms of some background for, for City Council with respect to the, the, uh, the, um, the um, view of staff with respect to where the particular where these particular trees are in their life cycle and um, so I, I think that uh, I think that the uh, the indication from staff was uh, uh, these trees can and are being managed at this point they are not uh, they're not imminently going to die they are, they require uh, they require a lot of work but if that there is a if there is a request by a resident to uh, remove the tree uh, um, uh, in advance of uh, what the city can do in terms of maintaining it, that they're suggesting that's why the, pol the tree policy is in place, and that the that the 500 the, their recommendation of the $500 uh, is uh, is justified in terms of uh, basically uh, covering the cost of the removal of the tree. And this again, just to bring you up to speed, is the removal of a tree on eight weed crescent. So, and it's a, uh, it is a choke cherry tree that you want to remove. Yeah. Your recommendation then is for? The recommendation is uh, to follow the staff recommendation that um, the um, the um, the property owner pay the removal cost, which been been assessed at five hundred dollars. And the, the information and the reason for it is provided within the uh, uh, report uh, submitted by uh, Linda Prokop. Do we have? Yep. Thanks, Your Worship. I'd make a motion that the request of the homeowner at 8 Weeb Crescent to remove the city-owned uh, Schubert Choke Cherry tree in front of the property be approved with the condition that the homeowner pay a $500 fee to the city for the cost of that tree removal. Second. I'll second that motion, Your Worship. Discussion? Thanks, Your Worship. Uh, I, I know that this uh, kind lady has volunteered to pay the $500 for us, but um, is that typically what we do? Uh, how often does this happen? You know, give me some background on this. Um, how often do we remove trees for residents that are an issue? Your Worship, uh, the information that I have is that this is done regularly uh, at the request of uh, the request of uh, property owners, um, and the policy is what has been uh, has what been applied. Again, the the condition of the tree at this point, while it's still manageable, is such that you know it's uh, staff are not recommending there be a full assessment on what the value of the tree is in line with the property. They're saying in this particular case. That that just covering the actual costs of the tree is is uh, is appropriate, and uh, this is the this is the uh, this is the process by which the city has been used uh, since uh, 2004. From what I see, yeah. If you know, go ahead, Mr. Be Mr. Yes, thank you, Worship. I would just like to uh, thank staff for providing the report that we did get from uh, our parks and. Uh, administrator because I, I think she did explain that the city is managing the tree it they we saw pictures of it and the tree still does look very good and that uh, there's still a useful life to that tree so I think that just the charging the $500 to remove the tree is justified I also like to make note to uh, those that are watching that in the city's procedures for this and the body the the policy is that on uh, 3.5 of our 
uh, city policy of preservation of the city trees it states that the city council may or may not grant approval of the tree removal but in granting this the city council will, will hold the developer liable for assessment of the monetary value of the tree just to pay a paraphrase it and then it said any funds collected for the assessment value of the tree shall be utilized to replant a suitable tree at the same location or if impractical at some other location within the city and so long as that I would go along in agreement so long as that policy is held that the $500 that is collected shall be used to for replacement of the tree another tree because trees are simply uh, a beautification of the city and we would like to see them maintained within our city Mr. Mickle. Thank you, Your Worship. Before I vote on this, I, I want to be clear. So if, in fact, that tree was, and we crescent, was in disaster shape and had to be removed, there'd be no, no, no charge to the homeowner? Is that correct? Through you, Your Worship, um, the policy does not state that specifically. Uh, it basically says that when a person asks for a, a tree to be removed from city property, then an assessment is done and that tree valuation report is done um, and, uh, and the estimated costs associated with removal are identified. It does not, it just basically says that city may or may not grant approval for the tree removal. It does not indicate that at any time that the city can waive that fee. But that is that that is the that is what is in the bo the policy which ha which uh, was previously approved by council. So to answer councillor's question directly, there's no there is no element within the policy that talks about removing that charge. There, there, it basically premises that there has to be some charge when it's being asked for. I guess you wish that the part I struggle with that is that people that have looked after that tree for 25 years plus, watered it, trimmed it, and now they're getting charged to replace it. I, I will not support this bylaw. I think it's if it is there, it's outdated. And uh, I don't think it's fair to have, if in fact the tree is, has to be replaced, uh, if the policy stands that way, that the city would eat the cost. If the tree is fine, but the homeowner still wants it out, then I can accept paying $500. But for a person that looks after those trees, and there's a lot in the city of Weyburn coming up, that this sense of, sets a benchmark of $500, and I will not support that. I believe this one, Mr. Mickle, is that the tree is in good shape at this time by their city's report. You can, yeah, Mr. Hardigan, and, and with that, th that's why the $500 is being asked, even though it's there, if it. But uh, Mr. Hardy, I would suggest also that the policy, if you would, uh, look at this policy and fill in the kind of the blanks that are there and present that back to council too as to what is <clears throat> required as to if the idea that if a tree is dead is report saying that it's, it's done its lifetime then there is no cost to the homeowner even though they may request it removed there is no cost yeah if, if, if it's found okay if it's I certainly would I certainly would suggest that if the if the tree were found to be uh, any cause of safety issue or anything like that that the city would remove it without any uh, remove and replace uh, it. Would remove and replace it. Yeah, but this one, this one, in this case, this tree is is not in any uh, issue here. But the policy doesn't state that. Right. No. So we'll <clears throat> address our policy and update the policy. So for this one, though, we call for the vote on here, Mr. Van Bishu, If you want to speak, I, I just one want to clarify with what Councillor Mickle said that this tree does have useful life left this tree does have useful life left in it mm -hmm. which is why she's being charged five hundred dollars to remove it it's not a tree that is dead or dying it is being the health of the tree is being managed by the city so there is useful life so that is why she is being charged the five hundred dollars to remove it i totally understand that the, but the question i have back to you is if the tree has to be replaced because it has no lifespan why should she pay 500 bucks? The policy is not clear, Councillor Van Betju. It doesn't tell me that. Yeah, but the question tonight to be voted on is that we have a healthy tree, she wants to remove. And that's what the question is tonight on. It's a healthy tree, she has to be, yeah, she, she asked it, she initiated it to be removed, and that's why she's being charged the $500. 
Mr. I think there's one other point here too that we didn't hear uh, when this was first presented to us two weeks ago that the city would be replacing another tree in here right. um, so is I mean I, I don't understand why she I I think some of the information we got two weeks ago that this tree was near death and and so we're not hearing that tonight that's Sorry. correct. That is, that, uh, you're, you're correct, Councillor Bailey. I think the discussion was that the report didn't clarify what the, that there was a, uh, that there was a uh, sustainable life in this, in this tree and that's, and it was good that Council asked for that extra information because I think it has clarified, uh, clarified from the staff perspective that there is some life still left in these trees and, and therefore that's why they have, they have suggested the, uh, the $500 charge. Any further discussion? Call the question then. All in favor? All opposed? We have uh, four in favor, two opposed. Motion is carried. Do you wish, do you wish your names registered in opposition? No? Sorry. Do you wish your names registered in opposition? No? It doesn't matter to me. Okay. At this point in time, the, uh, <clears throat> we go on to new business. Downtown streetlights, if you would bring us up to date, Mr. Hardy. Your Worship, uh, a preliminary report that uh, was uh, provided by the assistant engineer. Um, we had some, I had some uh, direct reports from some members of council that there was some concern about a number of lights in the downtown area that were not, uh, uh, were not uh, working. And uh, in doing some, going, getting uh, the, the assistant engineer to do some research, we'd identified that this has been a problem for, uh, according to Sask power, Sask power for some five to six years, uh, which the Sask Power has said they wanted to get resolved. And uh, my understanding is that the underground power supply to these these street lights uh, are not reliable, and anything that they've done in the interim has not uh, is of you know it will not be able to sustain the, uh, the the charge to these lights over the longer term. So uh, I asked staff to have a discussion with. As power with respect to the replacement of those lights and what the options were. In particular, uh, uh, we were interested in pursuing the use of uh, LED street lights because their 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 use of energy is much more effective and efficient than the sodium lights. And uh, so we made some inquiries from Sask uh, Sask Power as to what uh, what were the possibilities were. The report identifies the, the, the possibility of um, SAS Power replacing the uh replacing the lights with the sort of existing uh, the existing uh, types of uh, sodium lights that they that are uh, sodium and other lights that are, they use in their current inventory uh, but they indicated that they weren't yet they weren't yet in the position to be offering um, LED power uh, which would give the city the possibility of savings but uh, one of the options that they did identify was the potential of them providing the uh, basically a metering point from uh, in the downtown area from which the city could then uh, do as it wished in terms of the uh, buying the fixtures and uh, uh, the furnishings that it wanted to see in the downtown area and uh, would be just basically metered for the basic costs of it. Um, you know, so the city would be in time in a position if it went, for example, with LED lighting, it could uh, retrieve, recover those costs within a period of seven to nine years uh, if they were using a very standard type of light fixture. Um, this is a, you know, this is just basically a, a, a um, a report to introduce to council that to identify what the source of the problem is, uh, the fact that if it's something that council wants to do, uh, that it you know should probably be in the position of having discussions with the downtown merchants, with the you know community groups, etc., as to what uh, it would like to do. But certainly the issue for us is that if the ground, if the uh, if the uh, 
underground services are going to have to be dug up. Hopefully they would be done in a way that, uh, uh, in effect, uh, it could be done at the same time as any other types of uh, uh, adjustments would be made to the downtown. So until that time, until such time, there's not much hope for the uh, existing fixtures to be either fixed or modified or even running a new, uh, running a new wire uh, ground source to them because that would be a, an expense that, uh, you know, you don't want to incur twice. So I think what this does is it uh, provides some information to council that uh, it can look at in terms of moving forward um, and identifying its, you know, where this sit stands in terms of the priorities of council in doing this now or putting it in place and somewhere in the five to 10 year plan. Uh, but downtown revitalization is uh, something that council, uh, this would be obviously a part of uh, any type of program if council were to look at downtown revitalization, those street lights, if they were to be moved, replaced, expanded in other parts of the downtown or whatever, or, or looking at replacement and putting in LED lights in, uh, in the downtown. They, uh, uh, they are in use in many other cities in Saskatchewan. Uh, there is a standard that, uh, that um, uh, SAS Power will approve developers to put into their or to their uh, developments. Um, but if we want to, uh, you know, contribute to uh, uh, contribute to uh, uh, a more effective form of lighting, uh, an affordable form of lighting, then this is something that council can look at um, in terms of where it would want to go. It's that the timing is certainly something that council will have to set in terms of its priorities. Uh, so this was just to identify the problem for council to be able to determine at what point in time this needs to be looked at. Mr. Bailey. Thank you. Uh, Manager Roy, we, we've been looking at this as long as I've been on this council oh. uh, with, with problems, so I don't want to scare you with that. How many years have I got? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, have we investigated at all if if there was city owned what is out there to i mean it is the center uh what is out there to enhance the looks plus the extra lighting what that would in would cost do we have any any idea we would have to we we're not in the we're not in the process of uh we're not in the process of uh developing any cost because certainly it would have you know we would have to look at what the scope of the project is in order to do it i'm trying to get some general um uh, information uh from uh, from a, a, a comp from some companies that actually go into uh, go into communities and do this to get a sense of even what the cost per pole would be to to basically run uh, the new run the new infrastructure through uh, but uh, that would be that's something basically I would uh, I would do in sort of a, as sort of a next step to get an, get a sense of the order of the magnitude of what those costs would be uh, Question, though, one of the, one of the questions that I have just before you uh, turn to you we are talking from railway uh, railway Avenue all the way to Sirs. <laughs> The uh, not service to uh, Prairie Avenue, to Prairie Avenue, to the courthouse. This would be something that council would have to take, you know, give me a, a sense of what the scope is that they would want to take a look at. But where, where are the lights out right now? The Kurtz, right. They said they're, they're almost out all the way from service, from railway all the way to the courthouse, aren't they? I'm not sure if they go past Cotto, but or north of Cotto, but. Uh, thanks, Your Worship. I think largely the, the lights that are out are sort of uh, on that block right out front here of City Hall. I would agree though with Manager Hardy, I don't think we want to look at a block or two blocks or three blocks. I think we want to have a discussion about a scope then. If we're going to move away from Sask Power's infrastructure, which I'm a little bit dismayed at the, you know, they, it says on option one they would maintain the infrastructure. Well, clearly they wouldn't or we wouldn't be having this conversation. So. Uh, I think we have to have a scope about a scope, a conversation about the scope of which we would do this kind of an installation on our own. 
right? It might, I, I would venture to guess we wouldn't just do one or two blocks of Third Street. We might go over to Second Street. You know, we might do some stuff along railway. I think we'd want to have some discussions with, you know, I'm gonna, at the risk of having something flung at me from the gallery, we might want to involve the Chamber of Commerce in those sort of discussions to make sure that they, their members have got some plans. But also, too, is that, uh, Mr. Hardy, we are, when we, pro uh, the last council meeting, we talked about that we approved uh, in resolution, that you make sure that you remember, we approved in the resolution that we, because we had extra money here from this grant thing, we're going to do some water and sewer in the downtown area, correct? Well, there, there is, there, I don't know... Your Worship, I'm not sure what there was, what was, ex, what was uh, identified for the downtown area. It was, uh, but I do understand. But the discussion that I think we had when we were talked a, a bit about the uh, the downtown area was that, you know, th we needed to develop a plan, an overall plan for uh, infrastructure improvements in the downtown, which would include, which would at least, uh, in terms of even being able to replace the lights, would include sidewalks. Uh, storm and gutter and those types of uh, those types of elements as well and it, it's it's a long too long that if we've been discussing this already of uh, <clears throat> simply the last five to six years I mean we don't want this to go on like the recycling program where it's 16 years in the planning let us take I put it to you council to to put you to the challenge that we start discuss having this discussion to move this forward mm -hmm. sooner than later. Mr. Mickle. Thank you, Your Worship. You're very, very true, Your Worship. We have a field house to consider coming up. We have a new shop in the building in the workshop coming up. We have to prioritize some of this stuff, and we're going to do it right. Let's do our homework and do it right. Have we talked about it for maybe 15 years? Yeah. But that's all we did. Same as those trees out of Queen Street. Uh, and I thank you for doing that, Roy. Uh, this, this, this is going to take time, but it has to fit into the agenda of what, we, what we're going to do, because it also takes money. But we still have to do it. We've got to do it. Because, That's like you say, with the Queen Street ones, yeah. the trees are cut down. We can see the milestone almost Regina. Sorry. Yes, <laughs> just about there to Regina. Not, not but, not. It's, uh, so, but, but it's very, but we have to take action and, and start prioritizing there. Yeah. Any further? Just, just in terms of, uh, in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, movement, uh, I just uh, realistically would, uh, would uh, request that council receive the report and then basically we just refer any follow-up to be done. Uh, sorry, that we refer that any follow-up be done by uh, the uh, Strategic Planning and Priorities Committee. Yes. yes. And that will, that will be done. Okay. Yeah. Next, Board of Police Commission's bylaw. Your, Wor Your Worship, um, the report here uh, basically uh, uh, at, uh, there was uh, some discussion about the uh, the the Board of Commission. Uh, so staff went back and pulled a copy of the original uh, the original Board of Commission bylaw, which is still. Uh, 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 from 1992, uh, when the Board of Commission was, uh, the Board of Commissioners, Police Commissioners was created. Um, basically, in the, under the Cities Act, the city has the ability to pass a bylaw to increase that board membership if it so desires. Um, in the initial bylaw in 1992, the appointments were, uh, were made by resolution of council. Um, the uh, the basically, if uh, if the uh, if the desire of council was to amend the police commission bylaw, uh, basically we would need to build uh, bring a bylaw amendment in front of council and in council the, and so council needs to give staff direction uh, in terms of uh, basically the options are to leave the bylaw as it is. Uh, remaining with the uh, the five-member uh, board of commi police commissioners, or 
to add two members to it and, and to go through the process of, uh, of uh, putting out a call for board members to be reviewed and, and uh, appointed by city council as a whole or committee of council. Um, the process you know, is being suggested just because it's consistent with what was, uh, with, with what was done in 1992. Uh, so this is just being brought to council for information and wait to council and just basically uh, staff would ask if there's any uh, uh, direction that council wants to put forward. Mr. Van Betsy. Yes, Your Worship. I think um, as a member of the board, of the police board of commission, I think we had suggested that we would add two positions, two ad hoc citizen positions to uh, the board of police commissions. We, we felt that this would give the citizens a waiver and uh, more opportunity to be part of uh, policing in Weyburn, some of the decisions that are made, and also to have a, a larger voice in on the Board of Police Commissions and, and what is take, takes place. It's been noted that Saskatoon has moved forward with this. They've added two more positions on their police commission simply for the same reason, too. And this is what I would like to... Uh, why we, being the chair of the police commission, we'd like the uh, council to consider this, to have this, add the two more people, the, and simply more input within the city and this. Mr. Richards. Thanks, Your Worship. Just a couple more questions. So Saskatoon has added two, but what does that bring them to? And you know, what, what would Estevan or, or similar Yorkton, what size of police commissions would they have? I don't know the size for sure, uh, Councilor Richards. A, a Saskatoon would be larger, much larger than what Waverns is for sure. Um, I don't think it'd be unmanageable. We would add, we would end up with four citizen ad hoc uh, members, uh, um, three councillors altogether, two councillors and the mayor as a chairperson. So we would end up with seven as total, um, which is not an outlandish number, I don't think. And then we do even to have everybody show up at every meeting. You know, this way we're hopefully. We do meet once a month, so hopefully we'll get five or six out at a meeting. I, I don't. I don't think it. Uh, it'll be too much to handle. I don't. Mr. Make a motion, Your Worship. Yes, please. I'm prepared to make a motion that we add two more uh, oh. ad hoc oh. members, Councillor Van Betje, to the uh, to the Police Commission uh, body. Yes. Mr. Hardy. Your Worship, we would take that as direction to amend the bylaw and bring it to the uh, yeah. council meeting. Okay. All right, thank you. If, if the oh, if the motion is passed? Okay, okay. Seconder? I'll second that, Your Worship. Any further discussion? If not, call the question. All in favor? You have a direction then, uh, Mr. Hardy? Yes, Your Worship. We now come to this uh, very interesting one the field house discussion. With this one, uh, we'll call our Matthew Warren, Director of these services to come forward and give us a brief talk. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, back in May 9 of uh, 2012, uh, Council passed a motion to approve a long-term facility plan. Uh, within that plan, uh, it was developed to um, kind of set us up for the future of leisure facilities. So we looked at a couple things and three main points of that plan. One is to enhance uh, the quality of life for Wayburn residents by meeting the highest priority needs of present and future populations. Two is to align any of the long-term facility plans with other city, uh, city uh, long-term infrastructure plans. And three, to be physically um, um, responsible. So making sure that any project we do is fiscally responsible for long-term uh, of the city. Um, a part of that plan uh, was a, a community center. Um, so we're looking at uh, a field house with a track inside uh, and also including some other um, um, social and uh, arts uh, hub kind of areas. Um, so back on um, uh, May 23rd, uh, council passed a motion uh, to provide the um, Weyburn uh, Cornerstone School Division with their intent to partner with their new elementary school being built on the current uh, junior high um, um, land location. Um, since then, um, since that letter has been sent to them, they, they accepted the proposal from the city to move forward with uh, planning of a facility. Uh, so right now, over the last five months, uh, we started some initial discussions with them, including site um, design, uh, including uh, pre-design uh, for a new field house and other um, 
potential um, sport, culture, and recreation facilities a part of that project. Uh, so since then, um, there has been an architecture um, firm hired. Um, so there's two firms. Uh, it's uh, number 10 out of Winnipeg and Site360 out of Regina. Um, so for them, a big thing um, they've wanted to do is, is to start talking about um, what we want to see for design of, of a potential facility. Um, so um, over the last, like I said, five months, we've started to go through discussions with how we would um, design, uh, how we lay out the site, and that's kind of the spot we're at right now. Uh, so um, the last things we've done, we actually had a, a community consultation last week um, with uh, some of our main sport groups who potentially use a space. Um, so that's kind of the spot we're at for this facility right now. Uh, and it's kind of now in council's hands to decide what they want to see for the project and the funding they want to put towards the project as we move forward. Any Before questions? we uh, start any discussion, let's just bring you up to uh, a little bit more speed onto this here, and you can answer these questions also. That <clears throat> the last budget, in the beginning of the springtime of the Bross Provincial Budget, it was uh, approved to that a new elementary school was going to be built within the city of Weyburn. The junior highs are going to be torn down, which will be starting how soon, Matthew, do you think? Is the, the plan for them is to start doing that um, coming up here in the spring. And demolishing. And with that, the uh, Queen Elizabeth will be shut down, Hague will be shut down, and Surrey School will be shut down also. All the people, uh, children will be uh, brought into this. It is approximately, like it's, I'll stand corrected, that it was that approximately there's 600 children and it'll be built to accommodate upwards of uh, 800 children. With that, because of the size of that school, we are, there's three different levels of gymnasiums that we can have because we have such a large school, we will have the top size of gym, gym, gymnasium in this. One of the projected uh, ones, it will be a large two-story, similar to Douglas Park, Douglas Park uh, Elementary School in Regina, if you want to see, very open concept, very large gymnasium. So then the field house is one of the, the projected talking is that it will be, field house will be close on city property where the as now existing skating rink is at, uh, outdoor rink is, and that the school will uh, pay for the connecting link between the field house and the school so that there can be use of the gymnasium in the evening hours of this time. And is that basically the, the, some of the, the rough vision right now, but then we have to discuss whether we want to actually go ahead with this sort of vision or not. Yeah, correct, Your Worship. A, a couple of things. Uh, it's going to be a 750 um, child um, school uh, with a 51 seat daycare. Um, regarding the operations of the facility, um, the school division would take care of the school operations and the city would um, manage the operations of their own facilities. Um, um, so uh, and also part of that would be a creation of a joint use um, where you discuss operations of the gym if we wanted to use a school gym or if they wanted to use our facilities on the other side. And, uh, and as we lead into the discussion, the joint use will be, the field house will be under city control out of there as opposed to any connection with the school having any control of that. That's correct. They'll be under there. And also the parking lot will be the school parking lot, uh, pay parking lot, it'll be a pay parking lot, but it will be of use for the uh, field house also out of this. And this could go further to future ideas that the field house is not a field house alone, but a field house and some art part of art center into there. Correct. With that being said, open discussion. Mr. Van Bichu. Yes, thank, thank you, Your Worship, and thank you, Matthew, for that uh, description. And um, I just want to clarify for myself and, and for the rest that the city, if the city decides to go ahead with this project, the city will own the field house community center. That's correct. Not, not just have control, but they will actually be the owners of this facility. Yep, um, Councillor Van Betchew, the, the setup thing right now for education in the province is that they no longer do partnerships. The big plan for them is that if it's a community owned, you own and operate that side of that facility, and then you own and operate their own side of their facility. Correct. Thank you. And, and Matthew, um, I appreciate very much all the work that you've put into this over the past number of months and I appreciate your expertise and your ability to seek out information and that is very useful to Council. Um, I for one am very excited about the prospect 
of, uh, I'll call it a community center rather than a field house, because I think that more aptly describes what we're trying to achieve here is that it will attract a large group of residents from the city of Weber, not just a sport minded, but the uh, arts, culture, and little kids that would be able to, to use this facility. Um, when we had our community consultation meeting last week, it, it hit me that we're going to have 700, possibly 700 roughly children into this school, which brings approximately 1,400 parents that utilize, that'll see this facility almost every day and see the usefulness of it. It'll be front of center of mind. Um, I think when our community development officer uh, spoke earlier, she talked about uh, to live and invest in Weyburn, and I believe that this would be just a great amenity for the city of Weyburn to bring people to live and invest in Weyburn. Mr. Mickle. Thank you, Worship. Uh, very well said, Councillor Van Betju. I won't go in detail, but I do so. Uh, totally support what you said, uh, Councillor uh, Van Betju. And Matthew, thank you for the work you've done on this. Uh, and there's, little, there's more work to do as we go into it. The Weyburn is ready for this, and not only a field house, and I'm glad you said that, let's them get the arts involved and everything else to a community facility that we can be proud of for our children and the children in the future, even the older folks like me that will enjoy some of this because you know what? There's a lot of people in this city that have waited for some of this stuff and you know what? It's coming true. And I, I, I'm excited about it. Uh, when we saw those facilities in Moose Jaw, Regina and Regina the other day, out of Moose Jaw I didn't get much. Out of the first Everest place it was nothing. But when I saw the lights at the University of Worship in that facility, it spoke right there. There it is. And it, wherever it's time, it's time for this field house and uh, the time is now. Thanks, Matthew. Before we uh, start into this, one of the aspects again is to make this field house, we've talked uh, as this being a multi-generational one so that everyone can join. In the Moose Jaw field house you saw where they charge a very minimal uh, fee, a, a couple dollars, so that uh, people can bring their little children into the field house during the day. And they can run around in the winter time, run around on the, on the uh, artificial turf, artificial centers there, do the running like they're running on grass. Uh, they have and all the aspects they have a walking track is one of the things and moose jaw was most exceptional that they had a, a two dollar a day or thirty dollars for the month sort of fee whatever fee structure would have to set up but with that one that was what moose jaw did and the place was filled with uh people seniors if you want to call it but uh people running walking on the tracks uh all throughout, even in this type of weather, let alone what happens in the winter weather. Go ahead, Mr. Uh, oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm, I, I think it is time for Weyburn to step here. Um, cost always is a is a factor, and as our discussion was last Thursday evening, is what are we going to get for what dollar? And until I see that, um, you know, I'm still going. I want this but where's that responsibility lie and, and where it is. So I think we have to keep that in mind also. We have to be progressive to try to get this happening. So what are we gonna get for this smaller dollar? What are we gonna get for the midsize? Or what are we gonna get for the full meal deal if you wish to call it that? And where is that gonna come into our city's budget? That's first and foremost. Can we afford this? And at what level can we afford? In saying that, I don't wanna half do this. I want to make it, hopefully, that something that it stands out. Uh, it's useful. It can be utilized by many, many people. That's the objective. But where's the dollar sign and how are we going to achieve raising that dollars? Let's go to work. Thank you for the work you've done. But we got a long ways to go. And, and we have a time frame on this I, to make a decision. Am I correct with the yeah, they're right now going into conceptual design, um, so that's within the next couple of weeks. Uh, so we're looking for an answer back from the city of, of what you want to include into that area where they'll come back with some pricing back to the city. Uh, the plan is to have both projects done by September of 2020. So we don't, and it sounds like a long time, but we really don't have a whole lot of time to snooze on this. One of the things that, uh, before we go into the next discussion of these other councillors, that Matthew, you said that as far as financing, there's a couple things that are falling off 
on our that we're finished paying for? Yeah, we have some internal loans finishing up. Um, just this last year, we finished the, the final payments for that with our pool. Uh, right now, we're um, in the middle of finishing up our, our phasing um, payments uh, for um, the Crescent Point Place and sports during a renovation that started in, in the uh, in 2000, 2003. Uh, so we're in the middle of having that money come up for us right now. Um, we've done a really great job, especially in the facility planning, uh, that when a project comes up, there's some funding available for another project to come up after that. Um, and we continue to do that with in internal loans to make sure that's set up for the next project coming up after that. And there's a possibility of grants, um, other grants all along the way, and other uh, ones going going forward and, and public fundraising also too. Yeah, a big thing for us is making sure that you're shovel ready for when a federal or, or provincial grant is announced. Um, a lot of uh, communities get caught flat footed um, if you don't have projects on the hook ready to go because um, sometimes a quick turnaround, sometimes they have three turnaround for, for application for some of those grants. Um, so it's always good to have uh, shovel ready projects ready for when that does happen. Mr. Richards. Thanks, Your Worship. I, uh, you know, there's not a lot to say. Our, our colleagues around the room have been very eloquent, and I'll start off kind of though with I think Councillor Van Bet, you really um, uh, summed this up nicely, and that we use that term field house, and I think we get caught up in a, you know, and I know that I did got caught up in the idea that this is just a, a big gymnasium, and most assuredly it's more than that. But I, I think Councillor Bailey has hit the nail on the head here. As we go into our priorities and our facilities planning, I think we really have to be cautious that we build the right thing and I'm always I am always trepid to, to, to go quickly on a decision because a partner has said well you need to make a decision straight away I want to make sure that we build the facility if we build the facility that we can afford the facility because we're building the facility that we need not for today but for the future I think that's sort of how I feel and I I don't want us to have to make a quick decision based on somebody else's timelines and I, I know that's kind of the reality but I think we need to have a very uh, I, I hate this word but I don't have a better one a very full some discussion about a lot of our facilities we hear about you know the arts community and that kind of thing and I think that uh, we have to be pretty uh, pretty good stewards of the tax dollar on this one to make sure that we build what we need for the future uh, on our terms mr. Chessel no but I, I and to add to that I just don't to go back to your debate is that I just don't want this to end up like the lights down in the city hall and like the recycling program. They took 16 years to make a decision on the recycling program. This is not, we're not going to, and that was just a recycling program. We can't do that. I know this is a bigger program, but I mean, we, so we can't keep talking. We have to have a wholesome discussion, but we can't hold back because the clock is moving forward, things are moving forward, and it's, it is terrible that we have this partnership, or not the partner, but me, the person that we're working together, are saying we're ready to go ahead and we've got to have these things, but that is the reality of life, and we have to make sure that we make the decisions with the information that is at hand as best that we uh, simply can. Mr. Bailey? Well, yes, it, let's look to the future. I mean, uh, that's a huge part of this. Um, it still comes down to what's it going to affect our ratepayers, okay? And we have to make it usable as many people as possible if we go ahead with this. So we got a lot of work to do, and uh, you have a lot of work to do. I do. <laughs> yeah. And 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 that's that's fine, but uh, don't I, I don't agree to be put under pressure. Um, a commitment is there to look at it and let's make sure we have all our ducks in order in that looking at it stage to make sure that we're uh, smart enough about going ahead with this. I want to uh, <clears throat> then draw up another qu the next question to you that when everybody's kind of beaten around and not really giving Matthew this direction but it gets down to the one question that I, uh, here's one question for you Matthew what did the Coliseum cost the uh, Crescent Point Place cost? The, the four phases of renovations to both the sports arena and to Crescent Point Place was 11.5 million dollars and so we did it over four, four phases within uh, an eight year period. So that was four phases so with that 11.5 uh, and doing your calculations towards uh, and that is all now falling off with all the payments and other payments are falling off so now with that and with that idea of how much it costs 
I want to say what range, if we have gotten down to this point where we're saying we want to see a range because we can't really figure out, but you said, what do we get for this, for the small? It's kind of like going into the car dealership. Are we going to buy a Chevette? Are we going to buy a Mid Malibu? Or are we going to buy a Cadillac? Using the Chevette terms, that is, but <clears throat> we could use Ford terms too. But, if the, but the point is, what are you looking at for your phase of your money? Are we, what range? And my suggested range are, is from 12 million to 18 million. Is that the range that we have to say, and say, what we, can we do for that? 18 is too much, 12 is too less. What do we do? Discussion on that. Do, is that a good range to give Matthew direction? Mr. Chessel. I guess more on that, I am definitely in agreement. We do need the field house. Um, I don't know costs. I unfortunately missed last week's tour, but I ha did uh, kind of do some checking online. But I also feel that uh, pretty confident in Matthew. I think he's going to bring to the table. He's done that with many other facilities. I think he's going to bring to us what he feels. I don't know what to ask for for a field house. I don't know what we need. So I'm putting the confidence in Matthew and his team. Um, I, th I think they'll bring forward what, what is going to be necessary. And uh, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Mr. Van Betcher? Thank you, Your Worship. Yeah, as far as cost goes, it, it, yeah, it certainly the cost is going to be a lot for what everybody's going to think. But I think we do have to wait, and I think we've let Matthew know sort of what we want. I think we have to clarify that and define it a little bit better, and then wait and see what the costs come back. If, if it's a $15 million building, we get what we want, that's great. If it's a $20 million building to get what we want, and that's a tough, that's a decision we have to make, but I don't, I think we have to get what we want for the right dollar. I don't think we want to skimp just for this and not end up with what we want. Mr. Rich. Thanks, Your Worship. 100% agree with Councillor Van Betchew. I don't think that Council should be saying to the Director of Leisure Services, uh, set yourself a budget of $13.47 million and go out and find us a field house. I think what we want is for him to come back to us and say, okay, look, it, we can get a subcompact car for about this much. We can kind of get a mid-sized sedan for around here, and we can get a luxury SUV for around this much money. And then I think then we go into our, our fall, our budgets and our prioritization, exercises and we say what if any of those three fit our budget but I guess the point is that all to save Matthew time all I'm asking is what is too much you said 20 million mm, now we have to stop and think about that and is 20 million too much I don't know we, because what it is, it's useless to him to come back and say it's 20 million and then you're just going well we're not going to. well no what do we want and then just keep going around the circle and coming back down you've got to have an idea mr hart thank you your worship i just thought i'd add something to the to the mix um, um uh, because we know that you know matthew matthew will be the expert in terms of providing uh, value for dollar as it comes to the programming and that that as well um, staff also have taken a look at uh, generally the finances you know of the city and seeing where this is at and certainly matthew is correct in indicating that uh, there are some uh, there are some costs that are coming off over time uh, through 2021 the bulk of it will be there uh, but even with that there's still a uh, there's still an annual payment of about uh, of just over a million dollars that would have to be raised or borrowed uh, to to cover the extra costs of you know uh, of uh, projects that are in the magnitude of 12 uh, to 15 million dollars so we do have we do have a sense of you know that's another piece that obviously figures into it and we've just started to do some analysis of what we have commitments for and those types of things which I think was raised at a previous meeting of council and uh, and uh, so those are also the parameters that we're, we're going to be working uh, working with and being able to identify as, as Matthew said he's got uh, in terms of the regular cycle of, of, of uh, uh, facility renewal he's got you know he's got a regular flow of dollars which have being out there and being invested um, in the city's facilities 
this one will be will add a little more to you know this will be a little more than regular it's not going to be able to be done in the regular ebb and flow of his reviews because it's a it's going to be a, it, we, he doesn't do 12 million dollar or 15 million dollar projects all the time uh, but uh, you know we have a sense from you know on the we'll also have a sense on the financial side of of uh, where the city city sits financially and be able to give you a sense of uh, a sense of that and uh, I'll provide some uh, I'll provide some uh, some additional information before the next council meeting that will sort of uh, give sort of a state of where we're at generally in terms of things like reserves and what kind of dollars will be freed up over the next number of years. Any further discussion? <coughs> if not, we'll move forward. So just that your next council meeting, you provide that information to us? Yes. Okay. Inquiries and, there's no inquiries and announcements. No inquiries of the city manager at this point in time. Do you have one? I don't, Your Worship, but before we move away, I'd just like to make an acknowledgement of uh, Mr. Field and Ms. Cameron sitting through this entire council meeting. They came here about an hour and 45 minutes ago to make a quick presentation on the uh, communathon coming up. So I appreciate you sitting through all of this, and I hope it was worth your nearly two hours. It's good to see some young folks in the crowd. Some future politicians. He's chair of the SRC. I know that Mr. Field has a very keen interest in politics, so I appreciate him sitting through this. And I would, uh, with that, I would say to you that if you wish to pr make a presentation to its council and talk to council about it, that there is a, I know that there's other city councils that have youth representatives on there, like the head of the SRC and such, that they are able to put onto council give their input, although they don't have a voting privilege, they can sit with council, each council meeting, and put their input. And if you want to make a suggestion at that certain time that you'd like to see this council consider that type of a thing as a consideration, you can come and give us to a presentation. I believe Swift Current and another couple councils, Saskatoon may have that too. And again, you do not have a voting privilege, but you have a speaking privilege on any discussion to see what the youth of our city wish to have on this. So consider that your invitation. The, uh, any other announcements? The other announcement, we had uh, the uh, Flavors of Fall was uh, this held, give the Agriculture Society a very uh, good credit for that. That seemed like it was very well attended onto there. Everybody seemed to have a very good time. It was, that was a very interesting, uh, uh, good night. And we'd like to see more of these type of events uh, continue on in our city. It brought out numerous, numerous people throughout the whole uh, city. Um, and lots from out of town also, Your Worship. Lots there were lots of, lots of visitors came in for it, and it was great. The uh, notice of motion, there's no notice of motions. Committee of the Whole. Your Worship, I prepare to make a motion that Council move into the Committee of the Whole to discuss the particulars in the land acquisition as per Section 94, Bracket 2 of the City's Act. I'll second that, Your Worship. And with that, the uh, Council of the Whole, uh, then that means that it'll be a closed Council for a few minutes at which time we will ask all to all the attendees to uh, to leave for a few minutes and then whoever wishes to come back in when we reopen again we will have a meeting with those at home we'll finish off the meeting and, and tell you what we discussed uh, some of the stuff that we discussed those at home it'll be a brief uh, break here while we go into this uh, committee of a whole and we will return to finish off the rest of the council meeting so with that, we go into a committee of the whole. We'll bring this, the committee of the whole has, has adjourned and we're back into regular council meeting. With this, uh, Mr. Hardy. I'll make a motion, Your Worship. No, just a minute, Mr. Hardy's gonna speak. I'm gonna make a motion first to get back in. Yes. But Mr. Hardy. He's gotta make his motion first. Make a motion yeah. first. So that, I make a motion that the council move out of the committee of the whole and back into regular council. Seconder. I'll second that, Your Worship. All in favor? 
Mr. Hardy. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, uh, the uh, report out from uh, the Committee of the Whole is that uh, uh, staff and uh, the uh, uh, the council uh, discussed a, a property matter. Uh, staff were given direction and will be uh, and will follow that up uh, uh, with further discussions with respect to the uh, with respect to the current property owner. And uh, Your Worship, will uh, will follow. We'll go from there. Very good. With that, there's no further uh, 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 agenda or items, so at that I shall call this meeting adjourned.